Alright guys, welcome to topic 2 of chapter 15. We've talked about the organelles involved in cell transport, in cell intracellular transport. Now we're going to talk about protein sorting, which is one of the main items that's transported throughout the cell. Now don't get me wrong, there's lots of other stuff that's transported throughout the cell, but protein sorting is really a, an important aspect of this. So in this topic, we're going to talk about how proteins are imported, we're going to talk about signal sequencing, and then we're going to go through some examples of each of these. As always, here's our topic objectives. I expect you to be able to discuss the examples I'm going to give you on importing into the various organelles. So it's really important that you understand these different examples. And if you need to go over them again in class, please let me know. All right, so we know that proteins that are bound for the plasma membrane are made in the ER. And we know that the proteins that are made to be kept inside the cell, either in an, inside an organelle or in the cytosol, are made in the cytosol. So how do they get into the different organelles if they're made in the cytosol? And that's what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about the transport through various different aspects to get them into the organelles they need to be in. And there's three different ones. There's the transport through the nuclear pores, transport across the membranes, and transport by vesicles. We're going to do transport by vesicles in the last part of the, in the last topic of this chapter. So for this topic, we're going to focus on number one and number two. So the first thing is, how does the cell know what the proteins, where the proteins need to go? And this is, all comes back to the signal sequences. These are specific amino acid sequences found within the protein. And so these are, they're various, and you can see the different examples here on this slide. But they say that this, okay, this protein needs to go to ER, this protein needs to go to the mitochondria, and this is how cells can figure it out, is through these unique sequences. And they're part of the mRNA sequence. So this is all comes back to the gene. So if the gene gets messed up, then the signal sequence can be messed up. And so then the protein may not end up in the right place. Even if it's fully functional, it could end up in the nucleus instead of in the ER. So it's really important these signal sequences aren't messed with. And they all have variable lengths, as you can see here. And after they're imported into the organelles, they're always removed to be fully functional. All right, so let's start with importing into the nucleus. We've talked about the nuclear mem or the nuclear um, pores before when we talked about how mRNA leaves the nucleus. But now let's talk about how we get things into the nucleus because obviously the nucleus needs different items, especially all those proteins we talked about when we talked about um, replication, transcription, translation. Those proteins are made in the cytosol and have to be imported into the nucleus. And so you can see here we have the nuclear um, pore with these kind of scary looking fibrils on the outside. And what happens is there's a nuclear localization signal on the protein. And this protein will bind to a nuclear transport receptor. And what this receptor does is it helps guide this protein through this big web of, um, of material that generates the nuclear pore. And this nuclear pore is made up of about 30 proteins. It's a very intricate, um, a very intricate protein. And so this receptor helps guide it through. And once it's through, the once it's through the pore, it disassociates and that protein can go and do its function. Now, as you imagine, it needs energy to do that. So you can see here the process of energy utilization for importation across the nuclear pore. So you can see here that as the receptor comes across the pore and when it disassociates from the uh, cargo protein, the GTP is going to associate with the, with the receptor and then it will cross back across the pore and at this point the GTP is hydrolyzed and the receptor is ready to take on a new cargo protein to transport across the pore. So it's just important to realize this process requires energy. So now let's talk about mitochondria and chloroplasts. How do we get proteins into them? And remember when we talked about mitochondria and chloroplasts we talked about the fact that almost all the genes for the uh, proteins that they need are made in the nucleus. So the genes have to be exported to the cytosol, well they bred into mRNA, exported to the cytosol, made into proteins, and then imported into the mitochondria and chloroplasts in order to do the functions we just talked about in chapters uh, 13 and 14. So the first step is the protein has to be unfolded. They're never in their native conformation, they have to be unfolded, and that signal sequence, that little red section you can see on the slide here, is going to bind to a receptor protein. Now this receptor protein is going to move all over the membrane, until it finds the contact site. Once it finds the contact site, this protein will be threaded through those, um, this pore-like um, structure and entered into the organelle. Once it's on the inside of the organelle, 
that signal sequence will be cleaved and the protein will be folded up properly and then it can begin its function to do whatever it was meant to do. So the weird thing about endoplasmic reticulum is that we don't think about them needing proteins imported, right? We know they can, uh, the, ER, the RER makes its own protein. But remember, if it's going to be something that needs to be in the ER, it could, it, some, it's made in the cytosol. So it has to be imported as well. And this is how the, and they're actually synthesized as they're imported. So these free ribosomes are gonna bind to the ER. Um, and what they do is as they bind, they will help produce, um, they will feed that protein through and as it's fed through into the lumen, it's synthesized. So it's kind of this hybrid situation where the endoplasmic reticulum um, synthesizes its own, but at the same time, free ribosomes um, work with them to do this. And so as this process occurs, it gets translated. So those are the three main, or the three main types of import um, with organelles that we're gonna talk about. And then we're gonna do vesicles in the next topic. So make sure you understand those three examples. So now we're gonna talk about the two types of proteins that get made. We have transmembrane proteins and we have free proteins. These play a huge role when we talk about chapter 16 next. So make sure you understand how this is happening. All, both types of these proteins can either stay in organelles or in the lumen or in the plasma membrane. Um, it just depends. It can go, they can be produced in a variety of places. So make sure you understand that, that this isn't limited to any one specific organelle. So let's talk about how free proteins are imported. And this is similar to what we just talked about with the ER. So what you can see here is we have the ER sequence um, on a growing polypeptide chain. You can see that little signal sequence and it's got a signal recognition particle. That SRP is gonna help guide this protein to the translocation channel on the ER. And what happens then is it helps thread it through and as it's being threaded through, the translocation channel helps um, finish, finish synthesizing the protein and that signal sequence is gonna get cleaved and it ends up being stuck in the, um, in the membrane of the ER, whereas the rest of the protein is going to go into the ER lumen and stay there. And so then we have a, a fully solubilized ER or protein in the ER. Remember, these are always water soluble, and so it's important to understand that. And so they just stay in the lumen and perform their functions there. The other one is transmembrane protein importation. As I said, this is more complicated and it's really important because this is how we get a lot of major transmembrane proteins that do a lot of functions for us. So what you can see here, the first thing I want you to note in comparison to the last slide is that there's these two different colored sections on these proteins. So you can see the hydrophobic stop transfer sequence. And what they do is these, um, these proteins or these sequences indicate to the, um, to the translocation channel that it needs to stop. And what it does is it spits out the protein and just now it's stuck in the membrane. It's just done. It's not going to let it go through anymore. And so there's the easy one where there's one pass through. So it just threads through like normally. And then when that sequence is read, just spits it out and now it's stuck. Now, a lot of proteins are, tra they have transmembrane and they're more than one pass through. Remember we talked about all the different pass throughs of those alpha helices with rhodopsin and other examples earlier this semester. And so what happens in this case is the protein is folded up kind of like a hairpin so that all these signals are lined up. And what happens is as the translocation channel reads them, then it'll spit it out. And as you can see here, then in this example, there's two pass-throughs of the membrane on this protein. Um, we're gonna talk about G protein coupled receptors in the next chapter. Those have seven pass-throughs and there's ones that have a lot more. So it's important to understand how this works and that that's, it's all because of these stop transfer sequences that get these embedded. Now remember, Anytime we have an embedded protein, sightedness is crucial. The it's really, really important that the uh, protein is embedded properly in order for it to function right. So it's important that not only does the protein get embedded right, but that the sightedness is maintained. So it's important to understand how that works. So this is the end of this topic. And in the next topic, we're gonna talk about vesicle transport. And we're gonna talk about the secretory pathway and the endocytic pathway. And so when you're ready, move on to that one.